You know, Jeff, the sun and the stars tell me that I'm an Aries. I'm generous, honest, and confident. And you, you're a Virgo. You're kind, loyal, and analytical. Uh, that's all great, Mike, but I'm pretty sure that's astrology. We're here today to talk about astronomy. Now this, this is astronomy. Is that a cat? Hey everyone, Meteor Mike and Weather Chef here. You know us as forecasters for the weather here on Earth. Right, but did you know beyond our own atmosphere lies a different kind of weather? Space weather. It refers to the variable conditions on the sun and in space that can influence the performance of technology we use on Earth. Severe celestial storms can cause damage to critical infrastructure. So much like our own hyperlocal forecast, it's crucial that these are accurate. Today, the News 12 Weather Squad is at Bronx High School of Science for a cosmic course to learn about the relationship between Earth and space weather. And we're bound to meet some future scientists as well. Bronx High School of Science is known to have a worldwide reputation as one of the finest public secondary schools in the country. The college prep school focuses on science and offers students advanced elective courses like astronomy. And helping us out today with Weather Squad Fact or Fiction, we have students from the Bronx High School of Science's Astronomy Club. We got Sebastian, Devin, Kaya, and Jesse. Fact or Fiction, the Northern Lights are only visible up the North Pole. Yeah, that's actually fiction. Uh, the Northern Lights, otherwise known as Aurora Borealis, can also be seen in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, which, are, which is known as uh, Aurora Australis. And also it can be seen at lower latitudes depending on the strength of the event that causes them. It's impossible to forecast when a sunstorm will occur. That is fiction. Uh, so basically there are sunspots in the sun as well as sunstorms. And these sunspots are correlating, uh, they're caused by directly the sun's magnetic field. Fact or fiction, the moon is not the only celestial body that causes astronomical high tides or low tides. That's a fact. The sun also causes high tides and in fact elongates these tides during full and new moons when it's aligned with the moon, adding on to its force. You know folks, climate change also has an effect on high tides and low tides. And for more on that, let's turn it over to our meteorologist Michelle Powers with The Powers of Climate. Hi Mike, hi Jeff. Yes, you are absolutely correct. Our warming climate has helped create higher sea levels and thus more coastal flooding. We've certainly seen our fair share of that here around the tri-state area. Sea levels are rising. There are a few factors that of course go into that, but global temperature rise is a big contributor. Sea levels have risen more than seven inches since 1900, and they aren't going to stop. That additional water is pushing our tides higher and higher. From 2005 to 2015, the average number of flooding days has increased 75% from Virginia up to Maine. In a study done by Climate Central, 30 sites were analyzed. An average year this decade had 153 days of flooding. Assuming a sea level rise of 3.3 feet over this century, this would give us over 2,800 flooding days by the 2040s, and by 2070, it would triple. Now, sometimes higher tides are due to the king tide phenomenon, and this is where the astronomy part kicks in. Due to our elliptical orbit, our tides are sometimes extra high. Throw in a storm and flooding will be even worse. According to a former director at NOAA, Margaret Davidson, today's floods are tomorrow's high tides. With rising sea levels, the flooding and higher storm surge will reshape our coastline and shrink our beaches. Thanks so much, Michelle. All right, guys, uh, I would assume you probably have a favorite beach, right? How do you feel about that beach one day becoming smaller or maybe even non-existent due to erosion? What would your mood cast be for that? Probably around here. I, uh, I frequent the beach a lot in the summer, and if I lost my favorite beach, I'd be pretty devastated. Mm. Personally, I'd be about here. I'm more apathetic about that because I don't go to the beach often personally. <laughs> it's not my type of place. I'm more of a cold guy rather than a warm guy. I'm pretty much down here, same with Devin. I have a lot of family that kind of lives near the coast, so if our family were to suddenly not have our homes anymore, it'd be pretty bad. Yeah, I, I mean, and you see it even not with big storms. You see it with small storms, the beach erosion, and kind of you get that shelf where the sand 
sand just breaks off, you know, because the water comes up so high. So definitely, I mean, I love the beach. Uh, so even to see that and thinking down the line next 25, 50 years, where we're gonna be at because of those rising uh, tides, because of the astronomical high tides, uh, definitely worrisome. So. Yeah, and especially if I can't get some spicy sun time out on the Jersey Shore. Mike needs his spicy, folks. You know, you know that by uh, now. I need, I need my sun, I need my spicy sun, folks. You can always check out <laughs> News 12's exclusive moodcast every weekday morning. Oftentimes, people confuse astronomy with astrology. Astrology is the study of how the movement of celestial bodies can affect people's behavior. Right, and astronomy is how those celestial bodies work in a scientific and physical space. Right, and today we're here to get better insight of how astronomers do their job. All right, students, show us how it's done. So with this uh, telescope, we have a very special lens that blocks out well over 90% of all the light coming towards it from the sun. So what kind of interesting things could we see if we use this telescope in particular? So you can see basically all of the corona of the sun, which oh. is the outermost layer. The corona is where uh, solar storms happen, where you can see sunspots. This is the kind of thing you want to have if you have a telescope and you want to look at any kind of solar yeah. event, like a like a like uh, an eclipse or the transit of Mercury, which has happened. You have to have that on, right? Yeah, you if you're just, skirting your yeah, eyes. Yeah, yeah. If, if you don't have special like optical glasses that help if you look at the sun without hurting your eyes, it will permanently damage the, uh, the light receptors in the back of your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Never look directly at yeah. the sun. Yeah, if you look directly at the <laughs> sun, so that's, that's not a good <laughs> right. idea. Uh, welcome to our planetarium. In here, we can look at all sorts of different things. We can move ourselves around the globe so that we can see the night sky from wherever we are. Back to school, we're in the classroom now. Sebastian, you're gonna teach us how to measure the circumference of the Earth? Yes, so this is a method that the Greek uh, mathematician from Alexandria, Aristophanes, used. So basically, he came across an account uh, that this one place in southern Egypt named Aswan had no shadows on the longest day of the year, which we now call the summer solstice. However, on the same day of the year in Alexandria, where he was based, there was a shadow. And he could measure the angle the shadow made, the angle theta the shadow made with the object. He presumed that if there is an angle difference between the two different shadows, the Earth must be curved. Because if it was straight and there's two different objects, they would both either cast a shadow or no shadow. It's impossible for them to cast different amounts of shadow. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, that was awesome, teaching us how to measure the circumference of the Earth. Uh, going through some fact or fiction with us. Really, really cool. You guys are stars. And uh, I'll tell you what, folks, the future is bright oh here in the Bronx. <laughs> oh. You know, Jeff, I think you need some stronger glasses, maybe eclipse glasses for this one. I know, no, in all seriousness, you guys are so smart right. and uh, you go, you're going places. Yeah, so. thank you guys so much for meeting up with the Weather Squad today. Planetarium is awesome and so is the Fact of Fiction, so thank you, really. All right, guys, do you go stargazing? And if so, where? Let us know. We also want to know if you're afraid of rising tides eroding your local beaches. Leave us a comment with that information. Yeah, and make sure to send us your astrophotography and we'll be sure to show it on the next episode of Weather Squad. And you can follow all of our adventures by following us on social media using the hashtag WXSquad. See you later. See you later. All right, Mike, it's time for comments and photos. And before we get to last episodes, we want to stick with the astronomy theme. Uh, this past November, we had the transit of Mercury. Mm -hmm. Some real cool stuff that uh, viewers sent us. Oh, wow, look at this. This is from Frank Latch in Farmingdale. And really cool, he used, much like we learned about that solar filter on his telescope to capture we these. We took how, this photo. How wow. cool is that, both of these? And then we also had Sean Mills. He actually circles it there for us. Look <laughs> at that tiny little dot. That's, that's so That's not neat. dust on the screen. That's actually a planet. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Crazy, it's right? really cool. You know, I got a couple of them myself here, but this one's coming from uh, actually our colleague, Dave Curran's friend, Don John DeRiso, took this photo. And look at that. It's not just the transit of Mercury, but it's like the transit <laughs> of humans, too, because you got the plane in there that's as well. That's so funny. That's, that's really, neat. really cool. OK, of course, our last episode was out at Patel Cellars, and we asked you, what's your favorite vineyard? Do you have any pictures of yourself at your favorite vineyard and why? Two people say that they got married. Brandon said he got married at Raphael Vineyards and Scott, and look at these pictures, how oh. cute. Oh my goodness. I mean, Scott she's a little too young to drink, but <laughs> but you know what? It's the photo that counts, right? Right, absolutely. And they got married at Sherwood House Vineyard, a very cozy, intimate setting, and great wine, of course. Wow. Great photos, folks. Continue to send them into us here. Thanks, guys.